this has been this year. I've thoroughly enjoyed this and, and seen a lot of folks that come back every year. We're so glad that you do that and hope you'll keep coming back and, uh, as we grow in this. This is our last session. This chapel we always end on Wednesday at chapel and, and uh, we will talk about wings like eagles here just a little bit. Someone else will introduce Daniel here in just a moment. Good friend of his. We have Corbin that's going to lead our songs, and um, we've got Seth Parnell going to lead our prayer. And so, Seth, you make your way up, and we'll we'll do that, and we'll go to our songs, and then we'll have an introduction. I'm a friend in Jesus, he's everything to me, he's the fairest of ten thousand to my soul. Oh, 
giant tower and he's trapped on top and he's being attacked. You have no idea how he's going to get out. And then at the very end of both of the series, there's these huge battles where the good guys are outnumbered to the point where it's not even fair. And just a spoiler, the answer every time of how they're going to get out of those situations is the eagles. It's like right when all hope is gone, it's just like, shoot, these eagles just come in. There's that famous line, like, the eagles are coming. And for me, I'm like, man, well, how cool would it be if that was actually practical for every situation in my life? You know, like I have never been trapped on a tree on the edge of a cliff. I've never been in a, a battle, really, of any kind. But I have been at CRC classes before, and I took Greek for multiple semesters. And for those of you who took Greek, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You get in there on your final exam, you have studied your brains out. I never cried for a class except for Greek. Literally, there were multiple days when I was saying for my final, the last semester I took it, that I was weeping because I was just like, there is no way that I, that I know enough to even get a good grade on this test. And you know what I'm talking about. You get in there, you start the test, you study, and you've crammed, and you've done all these things, you've done the best of your ability, and then you get in there, and then like halfway through, you just feel so hopeless. And, at that, and it's at that point that I start looking for a moth. You know what I mean? Like, I'm trying to summon the eagles to just come get me and take me off to safety. But those of you who know, uh, who, who have been around Christian culture, you know where this phrase, wings like eagles, comes from. From this verse, Isaiah. Oh, what's your Oh, okay, there we go, there we go. Let's leave it there for a second. Isaiah. Can we go back one? Let's go back one. Alright, it's okay, it's okay. We'll just leave it there, we'll get caught up. Um, Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31. You've probably heard this verse at graduations. You've probably seen it on billboards, painted on the walls of churches and schools all around America. This is a very popular verse, and it's so quoted, it, it's so overquoted in my opinion that I would even consider it like the John 3, 16 of the Old Testament. This is people's favorite verse in the Old Testament because it speaks this message of hope. But the thing that, that I'm learning more and more as I study the Bible and as I hear these verses that are quoted and even overquoted so much is that we can kind of pull those verses out of their initial context and take things from them that were never intended. So it's always important, I think Spencer talked about this a little bit on Sunday, it's always important to take a verse, look at the initial setting that it was spoken in. Because every single passage in the Bible was written to a specific people at a specific place at a specific time. And it's only when we look at the verses in that context and see what the people were hearing that we can pull out meaning and apply it to our lives today. So for just a second, I want to just get us to Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, so we can understand what is it that, that Isaiah was talking about when he, when he said this very famous verse. So I'm not going to do too much because I know we've had a, a full half week of lectures and they've... They've done a wonderful job getting us to Isaiah chapter 40, but just as a quick um, overview of Genesis to Isaiah chapter 40. God created a good world, and he created good people to flourish in togetherness for his name and for his glory. But in order to do that, they had to, um, they had to uh, submit to the will of God because they couldn't do it. They couldn't work in this togetherness unless they relied upon the will of God. Now, as we all know, they didn't do this. Instead, they decided to decide what good and evil for themselves was, which led to broken relationships, it led to destruction, it led to downfall. And over and over and over in the Bible, we see the same story being repeated of God calling a people to be his, to flourish together as a nation, and then they decide to start doing things um, out of their own wisdom, which then leads to destruction and downfall and exile. And in Isaiah chapter 1, we see that this is what's happening uh, to Israel at this time. Um, in, verse, in chapter 1, verse 4, it says, A sinful nation, a people laden with, with iniquity, offspring of evildoers, children who deal corruptly. They have forsaken the Lord. They have despised the Holy One of Israel. They are utterly estranged. And in Isaiah chapter 1, all the way through chapter 39, 
Isaiah's message to the people is because of their rebellion and their idolatry and their injustice, God is judging them. And if they do not turn from their ways, they are going to be brought into a period of exile. Okay, I'm just going to keep going. Um, Ted, if you could just keep up with me back there. All right. Um, and so we know from history that this is exactly what happened. The people didn't turn from their ways, and they were brought into this captivity in, in Babylon. And I want you to imagine what it must have been like for this people, because this was the nation of God. God, up to this point, had made so many promises and he called the people his and that he would deliver them and he would be their salvation and all these things. And they get to this place where all of a sudden they are, they are taken over and brought into captivity. Can you imagine the shock of that? Like everything that you held as true, even though Isaiah was proclaiming it to them about God and the hope that you had in him is immediately destroyed with this captivity that's brought upon them by the Babylonians. What we, can, what we can see is that, you know, you can only imagine if you're putting yourself in those shoes, the depression, the fear, like, does God even care about us anymore? Does God even care about my life? Does he even see me? Does he even see the nation? Has he forgotten about us? Does he not know that we're here? And it's to this that Isaiah speaks in Isaiah chapter 4. Isaiah speaks to the people, um, you know, there's a, there's a gap in between Isaiah chapter 39 and Isaiah chapter 30. Uh, many, many years have passed in this time. The people have been in exile for a while. But now Isaiah comes to bring this message to the people of hope. In Isaiah 40, all the way through the end, it is just like hope has the microphone now. Isaiah 1 through 39, it was, you know, judgment upon the people with a message of hope in there. But in Isaiah chapter 40, man, it's just, it's just Isaiah preaching hope and comfort and salvation to the people. It starts like this in Isaiah chapter 40. Isaiah says, or, or God says, comfort, comfort my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and cry to her that her warfare has ended. Can you imagine that news after being in exile so long? Your warfare has ended. God says that her iniquity is pardoned and that she has received from the Lord's hands double for all of her sins. So Isaiah is bringing this good news to these people who have lost hope. Saying the exile is basically over. Continues in verse 3 talking about the way of the Lord being prepared so that he could come and be with the people. Verses 6 through 8 talking about the power of uh, the power of man is just a fleeting thing. It's not eternal. And you can imagine the good news of this message to the people after being held captive by this, the powerful nation of the time of Babylon, uh, of Babylon. It's like the power of man is just a fleeting thing, but the power of God is eternal. So then Isaiah calls for the people to behold their God. To see him and to trust in him. But in verse 27, we really see where the people were at this point in the exile. When they say, in, when, when Isaiah says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded from my God? See, it seems like instead of beholding God, Seeing him for who he was, praising him. The people had just come to this place of doubt. Like, does God even care about my life at this point? Has he forgotten me? And it is right after this phrase that we come to the passage of attention this morning. Isaiah chapter 40, verses 28 through 31. Isaiah says, have you not known have you not heard the Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth? He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint. And to him who has no might, he increases his strength. Even youths shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. 
But they who wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with the wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. The first words of this paragraph is Isaiah talking about the Creator God. For those of you who are into the Hebrew names of God, this is the, the name Elohim, the Almighty Creator God who has created, created everything. And Isaiah is talking about, in this passage, the strength of God. Remember, he just talked about the strength of man and how it is fleeting. But now he moves in and starts talking about the power and the strength and the might of God and how he wants to give it to his people. It says that God does not faint or grow weary and immediately contrasts it with even youths, right? The stage of life where we have the most energy. Even youths shall faint and grow weary. But they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength. So what is it that Isaiah is trying to communicate in this description of God? Have you ever gone through a time that led you to doubt God's power and presence in your life? I would say that you aren't human if you haven't. Because I think we've all been there. We've all gone through instances and seasons of life where we are just wondering, God, where are you? And it could be for a number of different reasons. Maybe it is because of the broken world that we live in. Maybe it is sin's effects going on, but maybe it's something else. Maybe it's something that's just led you to this place where you are just so unsure of God's power and His sovereignty and His will for your life. That's where the people were. And Isaiah is saying, God is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He has this infinite strength and He wants to give it to you. But what you must do is you have to wait. But those who wait... For the Lord shall renew their strength. I think it's important that we need to, to talk about this word wait before we get into the, the strength that God gives us. The whole phrase, but they that wait for, is actually one Hebrew word. It's the word kava. It means to uh, it means to wait, but it's also translated a number of different words like look, um, wait, hope. And uh, gather. Um, it comes from the Hebrew word kav, which means rope. And this is the imagery that we get from this word to wait, right? The idea of it is that when you pull a rope, right, there's this tension that's created from, from the force that you're putting on it. But, it. but it's like something has to give at some point, right? There's this expectation that that force will not always be there. That tension won't always be there. There's going to be release, whether that's the rope snapping or whether the pressure that's being exerted on it will be released. And so kind of what we get from this word, wait, here in Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31, is this waiting it is a continuing on with expectation. But it's not a blind continuing on with expectation. Every time this word is used in the Old Testament, it's always linked to someone. Namely, God in most instances that it's used. It's but they that wait for the Lord, right? We're waiting on the Lord to do something. But again, this isn't blind. And Isaiah does something really beautiful here because he looks at the past faithfulness of God to inspire hope. For the future. This was one of the most mind-blowing things for me as I studied this, is that I always thought this, this imagery that Isaiah is giving was unique to him. I thought it was an original thought that, that he was writing when he says, but those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up with wings like eagles. But this is not the first time that God's deliverance has been spoken in this way or, or explained in this way. The first happened in Exodus during another period where the people found themselves in an exile, or after a period where the people found themselves in exile. It's the famous story of the Israelites being taken by the Egyptians. 
and uh, God calling this man Moses to go into Egypt to tell Pharaoh to let, let his people go. And Pharaoh wouldn't listen, so God sent plague after plague after plague after plague until Pharaoh finally decided, okay, I'll let your people go. And then we have this huge scene at the Red Sea where Moses and the people, they are at the Red Sea. They're in between two things. They're, they're, there's this body of water between them and freedom. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh and the Egyptians have changed their minds, so they start coming after them. So God makes a way when there was no way. He parted the sea so that they had safe passage all the way through into their freedom. And then when the Egyptians came in behind them, God collapsed the sea and destroyed them. And at that moment, they had freedom. But, but later on, we find Moses on Mount Sinai, and God says to him, in Exodus chapter 19, verse 4, You yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians, and how I bore you on eagles' wings. And brought you to myself. I don't want you to miss this. Because what Isaiah is doing here is really brilliant when you look at it. Isaiah, you got you to remember, this is the Israelite nation. So this story of the Exodus, this is something that everybody knows. That everybody's heard and that everybody is super familiar with. So when Isaiah says... But those that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength and mount up on wings like eagles. That immediately sparks something in the mind of the listener. Like, oh, just like in the Exodus. It's Isaiah pointing back to God's faithfulness to inspire hope for the future. If you want to know how we should be, how we should get our hope today, it's always a looking backwards to look forward. We look at what God has done in the past, and we are, and we rest assured that if God can do it once, He will do it again. And that is where we find hope today. Another really beautiful thing about this imagery, though, of eagles' wings is eagles in themselves. When you look at how an, an eagle flies, yes, an eagle is, is a crazy, amazing bird. Like, if the lion is the king of the jungle, the eagle is most definitely the king of the sky. It is this powerful bird with, with a massive wingspan. Here's the amazing thing that I found about eagles. Uh, an eagle has an average wingspan of about 6 to 7.5 feet. And they can soar to great heights. However, they do not soar using their own strength. Instead, they use wind currents to lift them up into the sky. And for this reason, eagles love storms. It is literally their favorite thing. Like whenever the storm is coming, all the other birds are, are running to hide and take shelter. The eagles are getting ready to party. Like, they know this wind is about to come, and they are going to go way higher than they ever have before. They know all they have to do is they just have to get in that updraft and just spread their wings, and then it is go time. That is their time to shine. You see, because the stronger the wind, the less of their own strength they have to use. When we're thinking about this idea of hope, you know, it reminds me of those passages where, where when we come to those moments or those circumstances, those places where we just feel so weak and we feel so exposed and we feel so hopeless, verses come to mind where, man, when I'm weak, when I'm weak on my own strength, that's when I'm strongest on God's strength. Sometimes we need a good storm. To reveal God's power in our lives. But does this mean that it's not hard when storms come? Or those times come? No. It's always hard. All we need to do to look and see um, the truth of this is to look at Jesus. When he faced the greatest storm in his life, and he was about to go into it, and he was in the garden, he wasn't there getting ready to party. He was weeping. But Jesus knew God, and he knew his strength. And all the way through the beatings 
and the mockings and the death on the cross. Jesus went with the hope of God's faithfulness. He knew that his present circumstances didn't have the last word and that after these things were over that he would rise and rise he did. On the third day, Jesus rose from the tomb and because of that, we have hope today. I think it's very important for us as Christians not to mistake our hope as optimism based on the odds. Hope is a choice to wait on God with expectation, remembering that just as God's people rose out of Egypt, that just as the people that Isaiah was speaking to rose out of the Babylonian exile, that just as Jesus rose from the grave, we too will rise. Our present circumstances don't have the last word. And it is this reason that we can find joy when we fall into troubling circumstances, as mentioned in James chapter 1, verse 2. It is this hope that allows us to keep going. It is this hope that allows us to soar above our present circumstances for God's name and for his glory. And so if today you find yourself in one of those places where maybe you are just so full of doubt about God's presence and his power and his will for your life. I guess my message to you this morning is the eagles are coming. But all you have to do is wait. But as you do, hold on to the truths and the stories and the faithfulness that God has showed every generation and know that that faithfulness he shows to us still today. You are not forgotten. You are loved. Thank you. Thank you so much, Daniel. That's a great way to end our lectureship with hope. And we appreciate your message. Uh, Daniel graduated in 2019 here in December, right before the pandemic got to us. And uh, so he's been, been good and joined himself down in Conway, and we're proud of him and what he's accomplished. A couple things I want to mention, and we'll close uh, everything with a prayer just in, in a moment. Um, we uh, are going to do some things on men's basketball, volleyball, and Bible majors. You'll meet right over here when we're done. We're going to take uh, some things down and clear some things out. We still, with the pandemic that's going on, our athletics has been a little different this year. Volleyball's actually played in the spring as well, so we've got we need to practice tomorrow. And so we've got to clear this out so they can they can get back to practice. And so if you would meet over here, and you'll be given instruction on what we need to do. One of the first things we're going to do is help Mr. Boyd with uh, his books. He's got a box up ready to go, sir. Okay. And so if y'all can help him first thing, let's, let's get him uh, loaded up, and that will be a big help for him. Uh, other announcements that we need to make, Ms. Marta, do you need to meet with your advisors? Yes.